Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Melissa, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's a really nice group, and it's my privilege to get to read to you this evening. Um, so I'm going to read some poems, and then um, I'm going to give a little talk. Um, and I will start with poems from the book, and then read you a couple of much newer poems. Um, I also want to thank the weather for today's atmosphere, which kind of works well with a couple of these. <clears throat> so here we go. <clears throat> Pain. The mailman is drunk. It is spring. It is spring, and the mailman is drunk. I see him shaking his way down the wet street from my window, which is pretty. My pretty window, the mailman is drunk in, out in his slicker and bright boots. Did I say it is raining? Rain, and the mailman is drunk, and eight, only eight <clears throat> homes on this street, and he is crashing into air in the middle. I love him for this, love him drunk in rain, in the green pain oblivion is. Is it sick or strange placing myself here in the story, his green princess? I did say it is spring, and I see him, and see the new leaves, slappy wet, begin to make for the mailman a frame, a frame shaped like a leafy heart, a heart as leafy as if he, as if we were this raining morning happy. <clears throat> a kindness. This morning, I woke up angry at the Jehovah's Witnesses. Why not go help someone in actual need, I thought, or at least go stand by a well in case a baby drops in. But I was kind to them when they came. They were ladies and I couldn't help it. The one standing a little behind and staring away to the side, down to the end of the street, where surely fields used to be. The other doing the talking, bending a little, as if she were pouring tea through the screen door. What was it? Something from Matthew, something better than Jesus is watching. And as she was talking, I was bending a little back in return. Because there was something about the noon sun beating the bare head of the lady gazing away that seemed to demand it. These summer days, they are so big, so empty, so blank that long ago fields can actually fill them. And you can stand on a porch and, staring, fill up the fields, whether with flowers drowsing or workers in wavering heat or children in deep shade. What was the lady seeing? Maybe the children waving. Maybe a cloud coming. <clears throat> um, this next poem is called Maria Returns, and it takes its cues from the now defunct ABC Dayton drama on my children. Maria Returns. <clears throat> Today, all week, all summer, dark Maria returns to her husband, Edmund. She has been dead five seasons, but for Maria, turns out, death was only a loss, and she returns as a loss, standing among the ferns in the park of at last, at last, 
alone and holding a suitcase. Few on my side of the track would say how delicious this is, the waiting, mostly for Edmund's expression when he will see her again for the first time in the stables of all places, the humblest of places we'd probably all agree in the heat of our houses for love, for re-entry. Maria will cross the straw. Edmund will cross the straw. Deep summer, all summer, the hummingbirds ripping themselves to and from the feeder. Okay, if my book tells any kind of story, I think I would say it's a, a love story or really a longing story um, about a quiet observer in the world of cities and parents, mailmen, various animals, and even sticks and stones. I'm going to read three very short poems. They're from a really old sequence uh, inspired by a stick that I picked up on a mountainside in California. <clears throat> so, from the walking stick. History. Today, I took a big stick off a tree and hit the tree with the stick to make the stick mine. And then, as I walked with it, struck every rock within striking distance and even a few that weren't. I hit my way through the world. Rocks, daisies, water. Oh, it felt good. It felt like a million years. And recording it all with each whack, I thought, tomorrow somebody might pick up my stick, might turn my stick in their hands, and might even say to themselves, something has happened here. The Shadow. This evening, I called the stick Pearl because it looked old and elegant leaning against the white wall. Because in the quiet, the stick was my great grandmother Pearl's right leg. Pearl of the ragged Bible. Pearl of the soft backyard and the soft porch where the leg swung to the Bible, predicted a rain and dangled a black shoe. I knew her one evening only, and only as tall as her thigh. I said to the stick, Pearl, you can only be Pearl for tonight, and only by lamplight. <clears throat> Full moon. Tonight, the stick fell in love with itself. It lay on the carpet and acted as much like a branch as it could. It was awful to see it reaching for sun and birds and needles. I said, cut it out. I said, stick, do you know all your small round elbows? Stick, do you know that the birds are not looking for you? Or know you bend like a tall girl's arm when she's standing before her beloved undressed and in love? And the stick fell in love all over again. It lay there a while and was quiet, and then I shut off the lamp, and we lay there, looking at all that light in the dark. <clears throat> in the Jewish Cemetery. Childhood is like the hibiscus next to the garbage can. Wide opening cone, you miss though it's there. White ear with lavender hole, so close to your cheek. My mother leaned over and told me it was too sacred to bomb. So I took in, took with me the old stones, their marks, 
the walls that closed in, the fact that what was left over, over the graves, was the piece of sky they lay quietly under, periwinkle in color. My mother was very beautiful, always in navy, Givenchy, Dior, smelling of ribbed sweaters and flowers, and sometimes telling a thing so deeply into my ear it would begin to bloom there. And when we were there, it was twilight as it is now, and I am alone in the yard, or almost alone in the yard. Okay, so I'm switching gears a little bit here, and the next poems I read, uh, I will read, are all recent. Um, and the first one is called Honeymooners, uh, which references some characters from a pretty antique television show called The Honeymooners. Anybody in here kind of, yes, yeah, okay. And if you've never seen it, it's really good. Jackie Gleason is kind of awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Honeymooners. I miss the grain of Ralph and the grain of Ed and Trixie's grain and especially the grain of Alice whose pretty pointed body would never ever land on the moon. Alice was earthbound. Alice was of the street and the bus, and I savored her tenement kitchen, her world of the single bulb and supper, silvery, black and white, wrong and right as the mopped floor. And Alice was strong. She loved her husband, no matter how many times he threatened to send her up to the moon, Alice, his fist high in the grainy air of their bare room. She knew where the moon really was as the music swelled at the end and she fell every time into his big bag of a kiss like a clear and close star. And their apartment was gray as a lunar surface, gray grain on the small set I'd inherited from my great aunt whose name was Dolly, who lived all her older life with her mother, whose name was Daisy. Imagine the two of them, years in a house as modest and low and dark as a brick. No man, no moon for them. But I think they went to the World's Fair in Chicago, and maybe I picture them. Maybe they stood and considered the sky ride, gloves, a brochure between them, and look, Dolly, a thrilling ride across the lagoon. Um, I live in Milledgeville, and if there's anybody in here who's ever been to Milledgeville, I don't know, LaDonna, you may be the only one. <coughs> Um, there's just not a ton of stuff to do. Um, so it's a great place for spending time watching your neighbors. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called Moon Street. Moon Street. At night, my neighbor comes out to cover his car. He casts the big sheet like a net and smooths it over the roof and the rest falls like a dress. Just so the car's put to bed. It is a loving gesture, I think, on one of those nights when the clouds stay white as they cross the black sky. It is one of those nights like a night on a farm. The clouds stay white, the chickens are bid good night, the haystacks rise in stillness, and any child, no matter how bad, is good. But here, there is no farm. No hand wanders the place to check that the gates are closed. 
No river runs to the north here. No boots stand tall grass by the door. There are just our regular houses, our driveways and lawns, over the street and under the moon. A siren somewhere. And my neighbor coming back out, surveying the car once more from his stoop and raising an arm in the air, quick, inexplicable gesture. Then the light out, then in. He goes in. John and ask him, what are you doing? And he says, I'm going with my father to pick up a body. I pause because it is so late at night and no one has ever said that to me before and in such a calm newspaper voice. It happens. We're going to pick up a body. The Christmas lights in my kitchen are still plugged in. They're green, and the room is darker for them, but glowing. And as I say, what? I put it together. John's father's a minister, and he must drive on short notice two hours to Atlanta to bring somebody home. So there is no need to say what, to flash that fish of a question out of the still water, because it is matter-of-factly swimming away, and in fact, John and his father are already driving, already cutting their way through the cold night northward up I-75, which at this hour is practically empty, but for the giant signs and the stars. And we are strapped, John says, just as quietly, meaning because I don't know what it means and riffle the surface again with a hmm? meaning they're armed. We're armed, he says. There's a pistol in here somewhere. John is always soft-spoken, and in the folded note of his voice, the pistol is hidden under some carpeted flap or in the well of the wheel. And then, I couldn't stay home, he continues. It seemed right to go with. And I'm nodding. I'm seeing his father, the minister, I've never met him, making that journey alone, a man in a van on a terrible, solemn, armed errand of love. He must do it often enough, and it has to be better to have someone living beside you in that cocoon. No radio station would do, but talking would. Company. And for a very short while, there are three of us going, John and his father and I, And later, when I am sleeping, there will be three of them coming back, well after midnight, returning to our small town, which is a town that tucks itself in like a mother and leaves on a single light. So the night ends and opens, but I am lonely. I have to ask at the last, is it a man or a woman? A woman, John says. And then, again, it's a woman. Okay, Um, something else that distinguishes Milledgeville um, is the presence of Central State Hospital, which at one point in our history was um, the largest asylum in the world. It was so big they had their own railroad. Anyway, um, I mention that because sometimes I drag a lawn chair out there to write stuff, um, because it's very pretty. And this is the last poem of mine that I'll read. Um, It's a love poem, and it was inspired um, by a story Um, by Anton Chekhov, who's one of my 
all-time favorite writers. The story's called Gooseberries. So, asylum pastoral or happiness. Here, across the big lawn and over the dome, the gray in the sky is expanding, gently and slowly outward. And all over Georgia today, it is going to rain. And in the story last night, which I read to you in the tenderest voice I could muster, the peasants stood by a pond with the filthy ducks and the slick lilies, and rain, rain was coming. The men in the story were bathing, two in the bathhouse, one in the terrible pond, the one who would not tolerate silence, complacency, took to the pond and the oncoming rain. And when I asked you this morning, was it too grim, too much? I meant to be funny. I meant you are dear to me, as life would have it right now. And right here to my left are a greenish awning, great corroding columns, two doves diving in ivy and doorway, and spots of brass in the sky dull drums of brightness, promising something. Health, love, unbridled silence and stillness. One cannot hear the past or manage the future, but sitting back to a tree, watching the slight light shift on a blue cupola, feel one moment's happiness. Last night I read to you. And in the turning breeze, the rain that is coming, the cool of the pond as it must have felt to the man, Yvonne, who in his unstillness and in his delaying, the beautiful girl who would bring him sweetness and sleep reminds me of you. Like a candle, like happiness, so she moves through the pages. excellent sleeper. I have been all my life. I begin with this fact because I sometimes wish I weren't an excellent sleeper. I know that I've lost several, if not many, potential poems by being too asleep, even too half asleep, to haul myself one foot over to the lamp, turn it on, and write down the lines that float into my head when I'm not awake. This happens often, and I'm equally excellent at convincing myself I'll remember them in the morning. But I never do. Maybe those floating half-lit lines aren't any good and never were. I will never know for sure. But something tells me they must be. The minutes of waking agony, for example, when I realized that once again, I was too cozy and curled up to truly heed their interruption. But also the sure sense that they aren't or weren't fraught with ego, with my waking, worrying self. The self that supposedly knows something about poetry to the point of being paid to talk about it, to cheerlead others in the writing of it, to read it and comment on it day in and day out. Except, of course, in the summer months. When summer comes, I tend to read mostly fiction. This summer, I find myself scrounging for novels set in snowy, icy locales. So far, I've read Smilla's Sense of Snow by Peter Hogue, and The Left Hand of Darkness by Ursula Le Guin. And I'm halfway through Annie Proulx's The Shipping News. Greenland, a fictional ice planet, and Newfoundland, respectively. Snow and ice, icebergs, craggy capes, winter wastelands. There's something to this. 
and it's more than a revolt against the Georgia heat. I think it's the emptiness. These landscapes are like dreams, or the spaces they pull us through. They're like sleep, wherein we speak a language we don't know we speak. They're like the imagination, which calls again and again on what is not in front of us. A sweeping plain, a whitewashed wilderness. Le Guin's novel is my favorite so far. At one point, her two major characters make a life and death journey across miles of ice in a loaded sled. One of them is an alien who's come to the planet, which is called Winter, as a kind of ambassador. The other is a prominent native and, being a native, is capable of being both male and female. Much more interesting to me, though, is that he can speak without talking and teaches the alien ambassador very gradually to converse in total silence. And most days, as they travel, they can hardly see their hands in front of their faces. They're lost, but purposefully so. In a wonderful book called Three Steps on the Ladder of Writing, the French writer Hélène Sissou reminds us that we do not have dreams. Dreams, she says, have us. They slip a sled beneath us and pull us out and away. In my experience, we never seem to fully arrive at wherever they're taking us. Le Guin's characters, on winter, are headed for the coast. Their sled gets lighter and lighter as they go. They're headed for the coast and the frozen sea. That is one of the differences between a work of fiction, a plot, and a poem. We cannot know where we are headed. Robert Frost said it a long time ago, that the poem is like ice on a hot stove. It must ride its own melting. Art and life are intertwined inextricably. So, how does one cultivate a life that cultivates melting? How do you live in a way that invites a sheet of snow between you and your ego, your trusty hand? This seems to me much more important to consider than how to break a line or how to settle on the right word, and especially important in light of poetry's big settlements in workshops, in classrooms, in hallways, in places where no matter how much we flip classrooms or profess to a kind of genial unknowingness, we're all supposed to know a little something and to produce the proof. Here are three quick answers. One, go back to being about 11. This is, for many, impossible. Two, be high. This might work once or twice, but losing brain cells is just sad. Three, buy a one-way ticket to Greenland and see what happens. Again, for most, not so likely. About a year ago, a very lovely and sober graduate student in my graduate poetry seminar said, you know, some of this really is magic but we never talk about that. It was the truest thing I'd heard in a while. How do you cultivate magic, which, in a poem, is something like language, the dream, the sled, being the real speaker, over and above the persistent I? Like in this poem by John Berryman. Listen. The ball poem. What is the boy now who has lost his ball? What, what is he to do? I saw it go merrily bouncing down the street and then merrily over. There it is in the water. No use to say, oh, there are other balls. 
An ultimate shaking grief fixes the boy as he stands rigid, trembling, staring down all his young days into the harbor where his ball went. I would not intrude on him. A dime, another ball, is worthless. Now he senses first responsibility in a world of possessions. People will take balls, balls will be lost always, little boy, and no one buys a ball back. Money is external. He is learning well behind his desperate eyes the epistemology of loss, how to stand up knowing what every man must one day know and most know many days, how to stand up. And gradually light returns to the street, a whistle blows, the ball is out of sight. Soon part of me will explore the deep and dark floor of the harbor. I am everywhere. I suffer and move, my mind and my heart move with all that move me. Under the water or whistling, I am not a little boy. Someone asked me very recently what to me is the best poem ever. Sometimes I have a fast answer for this. Other times I think of all the poems I haven't read and have no answer. Most often the answer changes season to season, or there are about eight answers. But Berryman's poem always floats into the mix. There's so much knowing in the poem, so much outright studied, stated acceptance of loss, adulthood, and eventual death. And yet, it slides into lostness, it is pulled by cadence. The speaker, snow blind, water blind, dissolving, and dissolved. In another wonderful book, a collection of lectures called Madness, Rack, and Honey, the poet Mary Ruthley says this. I never believed for a moment that anyone ever learned a single thing about poetry from hearing a lecture. Don't misunderstand me. Lectures are important insofar as they teach us how to talk about poems, but never do they teach us how to write them. Nothing does, except sometimes the dead. Why is that, I wondered, when poetry is alive and well in so far as plenty of still beating hearts are writing it? And I came to believe, call me delusional, that no living poet, none, could teach us a single thing about poetry for the simple fact that no living poet has a clue as to what he or she is doing. At least none I have talked to, and I have talked to quite a few. Why is that, I wondered. I mean, I really wondered. I think it is because poets are people, no matter what camp they sleep in, who are obsessed with the one thing no one knows anything about. That would be death. They talk to the dead and have a rapport with the dead and write about death as if they had done it, which is utterly ridiculous because they are not dead and never have been and cannot teach us a single thing about death and being dead. And yet, here's the weird thing, the minute they become dead, they can teach us everything. Why, why is that? I think it's because the minute they are dead, all of their poems about death become poems about being alive. And we are alive and can be taught something about that. <clears throat> When someone asks me what I do, I never say I am a poet. I say that I work at a small liberal arts college in Georgia. This is not out of some projected humility or weird embarrassment. This is because I am really only a poet on rare occasions, 
when I am lost on the snow white page, when I know nothing, when I am sliding across the ice attached to a sled with no end in sight. When I feel this, I know I am writing a poem, and I trust my first draft and don't revise much at all. But again, for me, this is rare. Other times I find myself writing and rewriting and twisting and adding. For me, this is usually a clue that I never had a poem to begin with. My In my sleep efforts don't count, of course, because I haven't been able to make them count. I wish they did. In sleep, we do not censor ourselves. Another poem that floats to the surface when I'm asked that best poem ever question is The Moose by Elizabeth Bishop. Since I've been given the time, and since I believe she's among those dead who can teach us something about writing poems, I'm going to read the whole thing. The Moose. From narrow provinces of fish and bread and tea, home of the long tides where the bay leaves the sea twice a day and takes the herring's long rise, where if the river enters or retreats in a wall of brown foam, depends on if it meets the bay coming in, the bay not at home, where, silted red, sometimes the sun sets facing a red sea, and others veins the flats lavender, rich mud in burning rivulets, on red gravelly rows, down rows of sugar maples, past clabbered farmhouses and neat clabbered churches, bleached, ridged as clamshells, past twin silver birches, through late afternoon, a bus journeys west, the windshield flashing pink, pink glancing off of metal, brushing the dented flank of blue beat-up enamel, down hollows, up rises, and waits patient while a lone traveler gives kisses and embraces to seven relatives and a collie supervises. Goodbye to the elms, to the farm, to the dog. The bus starts, the light grows richer, the fog, shifting, salty, thin, comes closing in. Its cold, round crystals form and slide and settle in the white hen's feathers, in gray glazed cabbages, on the cabbage roses and lupins like apostles. The sweet peas cling to their wet white string on the whitewashed fences. Bumblebees creep inside the foxgloves, and evening commences. One stop at Bass River, then the economies lower, middle, upper, five islands, five houses where a woman shakes a tablecloth out after supper. A pale flickering, gone. The Tantramar marshes and the smell of salt hay. An iron bridge trembles and a loose plank rattles but doesn't give way. On the left, a red light swims through the dark, the ship's port lantern. Two rubber boots show, illuminated, solemn. A dog gives one bark. A woman climbs in with two market bags, brisk, freckled, elderly. A grand night, yes sir, all the way to Boston. She regards us amicably. Moonlight as we enter the New Brunswick woods. Hairy, scratchy, splintery, moonlight and mist caught in them like lamb's wool on bushes in a pasture. The passengers lie back, snores, some long sighs. A dreamy divagation begins in the night, a gentle, auditory, slow hallucination. In the creakings and noises, an old conversation, not concerning us, but recognizable somewhere back in the bus. Grandparents' voices uninterruptedly talking in eternity. Names being mentioned, things cleared up finally, what he said, 
what she said, who got pensioned, deaths, deaths, and sicknesses, the year he remarried, the year something happened. She died in childbirth. That was the son lost when the schooner foundered. He took to drink. Yes, she went to the bad. When Amos began to pray, even in the store, and finally the family had to put him away. Yes, that particular affirmative. Yes, a sharp, indrawn breath, half groan, half acceptance. That means life's like that. We know it, also death. Talking the way they talked in the old feather bed, peacefully, on and on, dim lamplight in the hall, down in the kitchen, the dog tucked in her shawl. Now it's all right now even to fall asleep, just as on all those nights. Suddenly, the bus driver stops with a jolt, turns off his lights. A moose has come out of the impenetrable wood and stands there, looms rather, in the middle of the road. It approaches, it sniffs at the bus's hot hood. Towering, antlerless, high as a church, homely as a house, or safe as houses. A man's voice assures us, perfectly harmless. Some of the passengers exclaim in whispers, childishly, softly, Sure are big creatures. It's awful plain. Look, it's a she. Taking her time, she looks the bus over, grand, otherworldly. Why? Why do we feel, we all feel, this sweet sensation of joy? Curious creatures, says our quiet driver, rolling his R's. Look at that, would you? Then he shifts gears. For a moment longer, by craning backward, the moose can be seen on the moonlit macadam. Then there's a dim smell of moose, an acrid smell of gasoline. So let me go back to those quick answers to the question about magic and melting, about how to cultivate that in the life, and so in the work. Go back to being about 11. The speaker in Bishop's poem arrives at that kind of almost wordless joy. We all feel it. Look, it's a she. Be high. The drug here is drowsiness itself. How beautifully, after the dog settles down into her shawl, the passengers fall into the homemade bed of the bus. The speaker has lost and almost as helpless to sleep, its memory and its language of retrieval as those surrounding her. Buy a one-way ticket to Greenland, which really is just a way of saying get out of the house, go somewhere unfamiliar, Greenland here is the moonlit New Brunswick woods and a one-way trip into the mysterious sense of homecoming they precipitate. Bishop, of course, was a poet of great control. That sinking, that purposeful lostness lasts for only a brief moment. But it's there. The descending fog, the snowy down, the bed feathers, and the voices like a scrim of flakes. And at the end, she leaves us with the scent of the otherworldly. Mm. Elizabeth Bishop lived as a small child for a brief but formative time in Nova Scotia. It was an eidetic landscape for her, and she was drawn back there more than once as an adult. Last summer, I went to Nova Scotia, and I drove down the road of that poem. It wasn't Greenland, no snow, no icebergs. It was June, and it was cool and dismal and rainy. I'd never been that far north. 
I'd hoped for, I'd planned, really, on seeing a moose. But I didn't. Instead, I got a great sense of that place as the epicenter of her most memorable poems. And at a small roadside cafe near Five Islands, into which I walked shivering, I got a hot cup of Canadian tea and an astonishing piece of strawberry shortcake. Three women ran the place. They were setting up for a dinner dance that evening. A fire roared in the fireplace. Here is Le Guin's sentence describing her character's last day on the ice field. We woke rather late next morning, had a double breakfast, and then got in harness and pulled our light sledge right off the edge of the world. And here maybe is another answer or suggestion in response again to that question about cultivating magic and melting. Experiment. Throw your ego out the door and as an antidote to all you know, Try writing a cento, a poem composed entirely of lines by other poets. Do not try this at home. Don't use your own books. You know them too well. Go to the library. Walk down the aisles. Open books of poems you wouldn't otherwise open. Pick a line, a line you like. Then keep moving until you've found enough. Take them home and spend an hour, or days, arranging them into a poem. Play with them. I'm doing this right now. And believe me, just the collecting has been a real and eye-opening pleasure. A dreamscape, a whole new topography. I know it will help me free me up when I get around to my own next poem. So to end on, here are four of the lines I've collected so far. Long days and changing weather. The fringe of light and the drift. For comfort, anything. Where there's other darkness, admit it. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to thank <laughs> the College of Education for allowing me to do this and the, their great support, particularly Jim Marshall, Michael Child, Jen Williams, and artistic tech guru Ron Braxley in the back. Um, I also want to thank my department head, Bob Fetcho, and the entire Department of Language and Literacy Education and my program from which I hail, TESOL and World Language Education. I also want to thank all the poets that have read in this series. Um, starting with Judith Ortiz Kofer, Stephen Corey, our greatest fan right there of the Georgia Review, and Jenny Graupess, also of the Georgia Review, Laura Newburn, Jericho Brown, and Tamara J. Madison. I want to thank Johan Huang for his extraordinary assistance in all things, including the beautiful flyer that you may have seen, which brought you here upstairs. Jim Woglum for his artistic support as well. Woodland Farms and Roots Farm for providing us with some amazing locally grown fresh vegetables to nourish us this week. And Tlaloc Restaurant, which helped us nourish us today. Wonderful, authentic Mexican cuisine. Of course, the Georgia Review, an awesome, literary, nationally famous literary magazine in our very hometown. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe the English Literature and Creative Writing Programs at UGA, WUGA, for featuring many of our poets on the radio this week and to be rebroadcast in September. Of course, these featured readings will all be um, broadcast on the College of Education YouTube channel, so you can look forward to that. Ron is to credit for all of that, and so you can Google Misha's Poetry Podcast or College of Education YouTube channel podcast and you can see all the readings if you missed any of them. And of course this reading tonight will also be on air. 
All right, thank these wonderful students in the class, Georgia teachers everywhere for the creative work they do. And um, of course, one other thing I forgot to mention is that we have taken poetry field trips um, many of the days of our course to inspire new writings. And I want to give a shout out to Katie and Lakeisha at the vet school who um, help tour and guide us and inspire some animal poems you might hear. Ann Myers Divine at the Harvard Rare Book and Manuscript Library, whose um, documents have inspired some of the poems tonight. Andrea Swigert from Evolutionary Biology, who taught us a great deal about the monkey flower and genetics at the beautiful Botany Lab on campus. The Green Acres Pool, where we <laughs> swam today, some of us. And I also wanted to let you know that if you want to be a part of our group, um, we want you to be a part of our group. I've started a Facebook page called Poetry for Educators, but it's also for our and our friends. Um, I think educator and education is a term we can all, all feel a part of in many ways. We are a part of education, broadly speaking. So please sign up, Poetry for Educators. You just go to that group, and it's a closed group, but it's open to anyone, and we welcome you there.